This is Warren Vanderhill interviewing Tony Costello, uh, Meredith Irving, Distinguished Professor of Architecture for the Ball State History Project, September 26, 2005. Uh, Tony, I want to begin by thanking you for agreeing to help me with my study. You're welcome. And as I've been asking all the people who've been participants uh, in this part of the Ball State Oral History Project, I'd like you to start by telling me a little bit about your educational background, where you're from, uh, and kind of get me from that point up to your decision to come to Ball State. Okay, good. Well, thank you for inviting me to do this. Um, the last few months I've been reviewing my past <laughs> quite a lot as uh, retirement has set in. Um, I was born and raised, as I like to say, in an Italian-American Catholic family, uh, originally in Corona, New York, which, by the way, is two neighborhoods away from where our president grew up in Jackson Heights. Right. Uh, and then in fifth grade, we moved up just outside of uh, Peak School, New York, part of the white flight from the city. Uh, most of our friends went out to the island, and we went up because my dad had always had boats on the Hudson River, so for him, the Hudson Valley was, was important. And I feel that I got the best of both worlds growing up in a big city and um, still understanding small towns. My dad started the volunteer fire department in this hamlet. And uh, so I kind of had a good sense of uh, small town life and that the volunteer fire department is much more than a, uh, an emergency crew. It's the local politics, so on and so forth. Uh, graduated from Lakeland High School and I had a region scholarship. So I knew I wanted and I knew probably from about 11th grade on that I wanted to study architecture, or at least I thought I did, between engineering and architecture. Spent a summer with my aunt and uncle in Italy and came back from that and knew I wanted to be an architect and not an engineer. My older brother having gone into engineering and we were slightly different in that regard. Uh, it came down to either Pratt Institute or RPI, obviously both in New York and both where I could use my region scholarship. and. Um, my dad was a plumber, so he couldn't give me a whole lot of guidance, but I had two art and architecture teachers in high school, and one was named Pete Tatora, and I just went up to, to Pete and to Tatora. Give me a spelling of Tatora. T-O-R-T-O-R-A, who actually had a fairly well-known band, played a lot of Westchester <laughs> clubs. Uh, and uh, I obviously called him Mr. Tatora at the time, and I said, you know, I said, where should I go? I said, I'm really torn. Both good schools, good reputations. Right. He looked at me and he said, they, always, they called me Anthony back then. He said, Anthony, where do you want to go to school? Troy, New York, or New York City? <laughs> so it was, took a great, I remember going home and saying to my mom, well, I know where I'm going. I'm going to Pratt. And um, at that time, Pratt had a really, um, and it still does, it, it's resurrected its uh, reputation. Uh, but I went there when I consider it to be one of the really uh, great eras of Pratt. They had a lot of wonderful professors. Uh, its one liability was being located in uh, between bedford Stuy and Fort Green Park, which isn't exactly where you want to send a 17-year-old. Uh, but I went there, I loved it. Uh, I think all of the li living in the big city came back to me and I felt quite at ease there. And Pratt had a really solid program. I, I realize now I had professors who were just phenomenal. I took architectural history from Sybil uh, Maholanagi and you, you can't get too much more tied to the Bauhaus than that, being the wife of Laszlo. Uh, I took technology from John Callender who wrote gra or edited graphic standards. So, I realized I was around people who were really dedicated to teaching and to practice. Um, very fortunately, one of our professors had come up from Penn, and when um, the UN started the Middle East Technic University or Technical University in Ankara, Turkey, uh, there's always kind of a sister school, and University of Pennsylvania with G. Holmes Perkins as dean was that, and Mar Severly had been very much instrumental in uh, consulting on establishing the school there, the School of Architecture. And when he came to Pratt, he kind of brought that connection with him. And at that time, uh, not too many people go back this far, but uh, Turkey and Greece, it was the height of the Cyprus crisis, and the government was really trying to balance both, uh, both countries. And uh, they somehow dealt with the Fulbright uh, uh, Fulbright Scholarship Committee to actually allow undergraduates in architecture to apply for Fulbrights. And so uh, uh, actually my Fulbright was done as a fourth year architecture student and uh, 
I transferred all my credits over there, or they did, and because my name begins with C and my other two fellow Fulbrighters had, were later in the alphabet, I'm actually the first American to graduate <laughs> from the Middle East Technical University in 65. Then we transferred those credits back to Pratt, and I graduated from Pratt in 66. So uh, it was a rather uh, great undergraduate school, and, and I think that certainly, and we'll probably get to this later, that opened up the value of travel. Uh, and living abroad and, and understanding other cultures and uh, that was pretty significant in my life. Um, applied to, you know, this was the year of the Vietnam War and 2S deferments and uh, uh, I knew I wanted to go to graduate school. Probably if it wasn't for the Vietnam War and the potential of being drafted. I had done, by the way, two years in ROTC <laughs> at Pratt. You could do two years of yeah, right, ROTC right. or two years of PE. Right. And, um, I thought those uniforms were kind of sharp, <laughs> although I was totally anti-war, kind of a dichotomy there, but, um, and had one of the great history, the history of military science. I had one of the best teachers I've ever had, Captain Albright. I still remember him uh, to this day, going through the Civil War and talking strategies. Just a great, great teacher. Was a ranger on oh, rehab okay. from some injuries, but wonderful teacher. Um, I got it, and I wanted to go, uh, I really wanted to go to MIT. I, I had. They had one of the few programs focusing on third world architecture. Okay. Obviously, my experience in Turkey. Um, and um, I also, uh, you know, had always respected Columbia. Pratt was kind of the blue collar school in New York. Cooper was the kind of out there, and uh, Columbia was always the kind of white collar yeah, Ivy right. League. We always used to have to have permission to go use Avery Library, which Sybil would call up and say, my boys are going to come up there, let them in. <laughs> um, and so uh, I got on the waiting list at MIT, which was quite frankly a, a disappointment, and I got accepted to Columbia. Uh, and I was kind of hedging my bet, waiting. Uh, and I got this letter from uh, Romaldo Jurgola, who had come up from Penn, had been kind of the, um, what would you say, the uh, protege of Louis Kahn and had come over from Italy and had really begun to establish himself with Mitchell Jurgel as one of the outstanding Philadelphia firms and uh, certainly uh, was to become now internationally known. In fact, uh, his crowning achievement is the new uh, parliament building in, in Canberra, Australia. So, uh, and I, I liked his work and I heard he was a phenomenal teacher. Got this letter saying that he was coming to be department chair, but he was gonna take 10 students and do an urban design studio. and. I kind of felt this was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. I would stay in New York, stay friends with a lot of my friends from Pratt who were now working in New York. So I went to Columbia, and I've never regretted that. That was a good choice. Aldo was everything that I had hoped he would be. Uh, and then I won a William Kinney Fellows Traveling Fellowship. Now, somebody you know quite well, Marv Rosamond, was my classmate there. And Marv is the person who I met and ultimately was the person responsible for me coming here. Uh, but anyway, uh, just to tell you about the culture shock of coming to Muncie, Marv also won a William Kinney Fellows, and we went from Paris to New York to Muncie in five days. <laughs> That's <laughs> so, culture shock. So if you want to yeah. talk about where the hell are yeah. we, kind yeah. of. Yeah. Um, but to make a long story short, of course, you also know our founding dean, Charlie Sappenfield. Sure. Charlie always felt right from the beginning that with the teacher's college reputation that there could be a good interface between architecture and the design of educational facilities, new curricula. He was impressed with Burris as a school that was at the forefront of K-12 education. To make a long story short, uh, Columbia had specializations. I was in urban design. Marv was in educational facilities. There was historic preservation and medical facilities. I, they don't do that anymore, but I thought that was a great focus. You went there, you took some classes with everybody, but then you focused on your concentration. Charlie called up Columbia, and uh, I don't know who he talked to, but, every, every, but every, he got in touch with Marv and invited Marv out here for an interview to explain okay. the situation. Yeah. And of course, uh, there had been three faculty members already here, Bob Lackney, Dave Hermanson, and Dick Pollitt, uh, the latter two of whom are now deceased, and of course, Charlie. And uh, you know, Marv told me, I'm going out to this place called Ball State University. Well, fortunately, I'm a sports fan. And the only time I had ever heard of it was 
there was a running back for the Philadelphia Eagles who had graduated from Ball State Teachers College named Tim Brown. So I said, oh, Tim Brown, Phil Brown. Marv's not a sports fan, so he didn't even know that relationship. But Marv came out here, Marv came back, and uh, he said, you know, he said, there's one more position open there. They're hiring four, at those days, we were hiring four, four a year to obviously take the next class on. And he said, they're, they're looking for, this guy, Charlie Sappenfield, is looking for somebody in urban design, and he especially wants somebody who, when we get, when they get the fourth year uh, of a five-year curriculum, uh, would basically be in charge of starting the urban design program. Uh, and that really intrigued me about a new school. Uh, growing, up in the, growing up in the 60s, and I say this now with a laugh, is, I, I thought going to a school where there were probably no faculty with the color of hair that mine now is would be a neat place to start a career. And I'd always thought of teaching, um, I thought teaching, I, one of the reasons that I, I really respected Aldo Jurgler so much was he had always maintained a very high level award winning practice while teaching. And uh, I always felt that that seemed to be a very rich, that he always felt one informed the other and one enriched the other and vice versa. So I came out here, actually, before I came out here, just a short story, American Institute of Architects was having its annual convention in New York at that time. And the Hilton Hotel was yeah, the yeah, convention sure. hotel. And Charlie was coming there before my interview. So he said, why don't we meet? And I always tell this story with a laugh. I meet Charlie Saffenfiel in the lobby of the New York Hilton. And he says, let's go downstairs and have a chocolate mall. Now I'm saying to myself, you know, we're in the heart of, of, of Irish bars, you know, you can't get a, probably a higher concentration per square foot of good Irish bars. You were ready for a Guinness. Yeah, and, and we're, I said, hey, if this guy wants a chocolate malt, <laughs> you know, I'm thinking a deferment because teaching, uh, architecture was lumped into engineering as a, um, what skill, a uh, critical skill. Critical skill. Right, yeah. So there was an automatic deferment sure. if you taught in architecture. Yeah. You know, you kind of weigh things yeah. like that. Right. And uh, I said, hey, chocolate malt, I love them, which I actually don't. But, you know, if the man's telling me what to drink, <laughs> I go. Yeah. Long story short, I came out here, I interviewed, um, asked Dave Hermanson, I remember this down at Clara's. You probably remember yeah, Clara's course. with the tree, yeah, with the, I do, with I the do. copper leaves. Yeah, yeah, right. Asked Dave Hermanson in my naivete <laughs> of the Midwest where the Italian neighborhood was. <laughs> Dave Hermanson, born and raised in Chicago and yeah, coming right. here from Kansas State, looks at me and he said, well, Tony, I think there's one family that lives on Riverside and another family up in Halterman Village. Yeah. I got the idea this was not exactly your ethnic center of the world. But uh, as I mentioned, uh, Marv and I both came out here with Bob Taylor and John Maddox, uh, basically composing the, the second wave of faculty. And I think Marv and I both felt we would probably stay for uh, two or three years, um, look elsewhere, probably back to the East Coast. I mean, my family thought crossing the Hudson River was going west. You know, why would you even want to go to New Jersey, let alone this place called Indiana? And um, as they say, you know, uh, I guess uh, after that I've never looked back, and uh, so that's that's what brought me to Ball State so in it 1967. Wasn't, so it wasn't really that you had, uh, you know, three or four or five job offers. Oh, no, 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 I, I never even looked at another job. Although, yeah. the firm that I interned with between Pratt and Columbia, which had been the McKim, Mead and White firm, now by the right. time I got there, they had lost any status right. as a design firm, good yeah. technical firm. They had, they were really trying to get me back there. Okay. They said, you come back, I, they, yeah. were, they were pleased with my work. So I always had that to fall back on. Getting a deferment for that would have been tougher than getting a deferment for teaching. And um, I think I just I just wanted to teach. Um, we, we got time to do this. Yeah. Um, so you come to Ball State, you and Marv, you know, kind of the gold dust twins like Dav <laughs> Davis and Blanchard you know, from, uh, from New York. And he would never change his name to Abbott. That's the thing that made me mad. <laughs> so, so here you are, um, starting out with a new college, uh, a dean who had a lot of ambition at a place that certainly had a reputation as a teacher's college, right. and then this professional school sort of, for a variety of reasons, plunked down in the middle of it. What were your expectations of the role of a faculty member here? Well, and I think I would be echoing Marv. I think 
I think Marv and I came out of schools that we a really respected. Yeah, I mean, right. Penn and Pratt and <laughs> Columbia, yeah. with me, Middle East, Technica. I think we had the same expectations for our students here okay. that we had for ourselves. I mean, okay. which was pretty amazing. Bob Taylor had come out of MIT graduate right. school, right. and uh, Dick Pollock out of U of I. Right. Um, you know, I think we just felt like, well, this is the quality that we're okay. going to expect out of our students. Yeah. And one of the things, besides Charlie, who was the best founding dean I think we could have ever had, is yeah. when I saw the Quonset huts, yeah. you remember those, sure, yeah. and what they had done, I felt there was a spirit about this place oh, okay. that reminded me of Pratt, who had taken an old shoe factory. I mean, our studios, Charles Pratt was a very pragmatic man. He said, if this place fails as a school, we're going to we're, we're going to sell it for an industrial building. Right. So this thing held like 400 pounds a square foot, big loft spaces. And um, it, it, I don't like to use the word nitty gritty, but there was kind of this nitty grittiness about this, uh, you know, corrugated yeah, metal, sure, sure. <laughs> former yeah. naval yeah. armory. Yeah. No, I agree. <laughs> and I was impressed. I was impressed with what they did to it. Um, and then my expectations were, uh, and I want this to sound right, that since I always wanted to practice, I always felt, I felt that at that time there were only uh, two firms here, Bill Cox and the Hamilton Graham. Right. And I said, you know, I said 70,000 people, probably this is a place you could establish oh, okay. over some time sure. um, a practice and probably do okay with it. Okay. And uh, interestingly enough, um, I, uh, I always saw teaching first. and. Um, I might conclude, by the way, that my father, who was extremely proud of both my brother and I, would not introduce me as my son Anthony the architect, my, my son Anthony the professor. Okay, yeah. Because in the Italian-American culture, right. after the priest, it's the professor, yeah. then the professional. Yeah. So I always thought that was an yeah. interesting... Uh, <laughs> well, let me go back to the point you mentioned where you said that you and Marv, and you know, I'll, I'll get to Marv okay. later, because I want to interview him too, but in your case, you came here like a, the vast majority of all state faculty members, especially those from the East. I'm going to stay here for three, four, five years and use this as kind of a launching Absolutely. to go someplace else. And, and, and I kind of learned enough about the tenure route that right. typically, you know, one of the ways to get to associate yeah. was to, you know, yeah. to go to another school and sure. say, I've had enough of it, you know. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I had no, no long-term, you know, all my family was back there, my brother was back there. Um, I really had no other reason drawing me back, like some of our colleagues come here because right. their wife yeah. is from Terre Haute and they want to get back, and, and um, I, maybe well, I shouldn't have used no, that example. Or from Cowan. <laughs> or from Cowan or Kamak. Yeah, right. But um, no, it was, it was definitely not a long-term commitment, and if you think of it, Marv and I made a commitment, and so did everybody else, to a non-accredited school because oh, yeah, you right. could not get accredited yeah. until you graduated your first class. Oh, yeah. I forgot about that. And I yeah. would always tell our first classes, yeah. I said, you know, you guys were really brave to come to a non-accredited yeah, school. Right. And I think it was Craig Mullins who said to me, well, you know, so were you. You, you know, and I yeah. kind of hit me, yeah, you know, you're right. It was kind of a chance. But well, I think we can get this in, but we can Okay, it that's right. So the big question at this point, then, uh, and I know it's a rather long answer in your case, but let's give it a shot and start on it. Why did you stay? Charlie kept his word. When we got to a fourth year, we were on quarters, of course, as right. you know. Uh, we started what we at that time labeled our urban design studio. Mayor uh, Richard Luger was mayor of Indianapolis, so that puts it in context. His deputy mayor for development was David Meeker, FAIA, I uh, mean, an architect of, of really pretty substantial reputation who, you know, was at deputy mayorship, which is a pretty high level of decision making. He and an Indianapolis architect, Don Perry, and myself team taught the first urban design studio in 1969. And um, I guess it was my 60s upbringing of uh, kind of uh, now, you know, now we call it the community-based planning or service learning. Um, a lot of it then was really pretty adversarial against the establishment. Uh, working with African-American neighborhoods so that the interstate wouldn't be pushed through their neighborhood. Um, it, it was really part of the civil, I've written about this, to me it was all part of that civil rights era, the Peace Corps era, where young men and women, I think, saw themselves as being a catalyst for change, often representing the underrepresented, sure, so to sure. speak. And uh, I love teaching with Don and David. Uh, 
Uh, by that time, um, I had uh, married my first wife, who was from Muncie. Right. So now there was some yeah, right. added reasons to yeah. start to plant the roots right. here. Okay. But most of all, I was absolutely finding what I needed to find. And, and, and the last little piece of the puzzle is, I needed another year of experience before I could sit for my RA exam. Okay. And Bill Cox in town, uh, he, he needed people, and uh, Bill and I co-designed the Huffer uh, Child Care Center right. together. I was my first project. Yeah. And uh, you know, suddenly a lot of the boxes were yeah. being checked off under Ball State and Muncie. Uh, this was a pretty good place to, uh, yeah. to be. To do what you wanted to do. And the, and the last piece of the pie, and I know yeah. you know him, I met Father Jim Bates, right. who was at that time uh, chaplain for the Newman Apostolate, but we, we founded, or I was a founding member of the St. Francis Parish, and that was another important part of my life that I found here, yeah. too. So but a lot of boxes were being checked I, 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 I agree wholeheartedly. You, you were able to carve out an incredible <clears throat> career that really you put your stamp on throughout the community and the region. But were there points along the line where Tony Costello said, you know, this is all going pretty well, but I'm going to look for some other possibilities. Twice. Okay. Twice. Uh, in fact, he had held a teaching Fulbright to Middle East Technical University. When I held a student Fulbright, uh, one of my great mentors named Renero Corbelletti, and I took my delineation courses. And he spelled Corbelletti? Uh, C-O-R-B-E-L-L-E-T-I. Uh, first name was Renero. We called him Ronnie. Yeah. Uh, he had assumed the deanship at Penn State. And uh, there had, I, I started to also find out about P&T being a pretty nasty right, right. set of activities. And one of my good friends, I thought, excuse the expression, was being screwed over. So okay. now suddenly there were some things that were being okay. checked off in the liability. Okay. And uh, Ronnie, when he went there, started to pull former students from Pratt, Mike Piatog and Richie Alden, and yeah. all these young Turks were, were being brought to, you know, College Park, uh, what, what is it? University, not? Uh, it is University Park. Yeah, 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 University Park, Pennsylvania. Yeah. And uh, being a person who loved the Hudson Valley, you can imagine that, you know, that part of Pennsylvania really is a oh, yeah. pretty wonderful yeah. kind of natural environment. Yeah. Um, and uh, I actually made application. Okay. Um, but I guess this is, this is, is, is going to sound really egotistical. Um, I was the uh, advocate for my faculty colleague that went before the, uh, the uh, review committee for P&T and basically argued that they were screwing over a really good person and we won the appeal. Huh? So, <laughs> so, so suddenly it was like, well, you know, you can also yeah. fight this damn yeah. system. Yeah. And the only other time, and this will probably take a little bit more time than we okay. have for this okay. first session, uh, when Jim Barker moved to the deanship at Clemson, he's now president, yeah, right, only right. architect yeah. to hold a major yeah. Jim invited me to um, interview for the uh, department chairmanship oh, at no. Clemson. Yeah. And there were, a, there were a number of things that were attracting me there, although very honestly, by that time, and I, I want to say that was about 93 or 94, mm -hmm. uh, by then I had really established myself, as you mentioned here. Our community-based project program had gained national reputation. So it was a tough decision, but um, I never saw myself living south of the Mason-Dixon line. No, I, I, I don't see either. Of them. Let's stop there. Okay. you got to get to the doctor. Well, it's a good story. You'll, you'll get a good kick out of my interview at Clemson. Okay, Tony, we're back, and it's Clemson time. Okay. Well, I, the only reason I interviewed, and this is going back to the mid, I want to say mid-90s, maybe early 90s, but Jim Barker had, who was a Clemson alum, had come back from Mississippi State uh, where he had been uh, department head and became dean of uh, his alma mater at Clemson. He's now moved on to be president. Right. I think the only architect had to be president of a major university. Yeah, I should tell you, one of the other people in that search was Blake Brownell. Oh, is that right? <laughs> right, yeah. And um, so, uh, you know, I'd always had just tremendous respect for Jim. He served on one of our accreditation teams here, and I knew him through some of the urban design stuff. And just to put it in context, there's kind of a triad between Clemson, Mississippi State, and Auburn. And faculty have a tendency to, to move around down there. Um, anyway, um, so I interviewed the three things that impressed. Well, besides Jim, they had just opened up their Charleston Center. 
which was a major, obviously nice city and obviously a concept I was very much. And then a very wealthy alum had left them a villa in Genoa, Italy with enough of an endowment for four full-time staff members to staff at gardeners and everything. So that's their study abroad program, one of their major ones. And uh, one of these days, I hope to get over there because I heard the, the villa is just absolutely gorgeous. So I interviewed, and of course, uh, attempting to be very honest, I interviewed and basically told them what I would expect of myself and what I would expect of them. And I don't know if you remember Don Collins, the second landscape architecture faculty member here after John Lancius. Well, Don went right from here to there and is still there. He's actually on the architecture faculty because they do not have an LA department, but he's kind of the LA presence. And he was my faculty host. You know, obviously, we had known each other. And so I got back here and he called me the next day and he said, well, you'll, you'll get the official phone call probably in about an hour, but we won't be offering you the job. And I said, well, you know, I said, I kind of, I kind of got that. I said, you know, I said, you and I can both probably read, you know, audiences. And sure. I had a kind of feeling the faculty was a little bit uneasy as I was talking. He said, well, he said, number one, they had never heard anybody talk that fast. And I said, you have to understand, this is the South. <laughs> and then he said, and this is the honest to God truth, he said, I just came from the faculty lounge and two of my colleagues asked if you were on drugs. I've <laughs> 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 never heard of that kind of interview No, 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 but I, I said, well, that's, geez, I didn't know I came off that <laughs> wired up, <laughs> yeah. you know, but anyway. Uh, quite honestly, I never ever thought about going into private, well, obviously I've always run a small limited practice, never ever thought of uh, leaving to go into full-time practice. I, I, I knew both the liabilities of that and I also just felt that I couldn't move away from, from teaching and do that part-time and practice full-time. Uh, in what ways do you think Wall State changed during the time you were here and then the other side of it? flip side of courses, in what ways did Ball State remain the same? Uh, well, obviously, it changed enormously in its physical facilities. Uh, I mean, we used to play football on yeah, Saturday right. mornings with, with Cap is now. Well, you're sitting on uh, top of Oliver Bum's old That's house. right, that's right, exactly. <laughs> the old uh, Yinko tree, I think, is the only thing left from that's these right. people. And, and the uh, old uh, ROTC house is across yeah. from us on Petty there. So right, that's right. people, you know, people right. don't like that. Wow, are you kidding? I said, no, they were, you yeah. walk past people's front yards. Yeah. Um, so obviously, in facilities, there is no doubt that I think certain programs have really, really grown and emerged. Obviously, besides the College of Architecture and Planning, I would point to the whole human performance and wellness. Certainly, the College of Business has grown enormously, the entrepreneurial program. Uh, journalism, telecom, all those have really grown and really, I think, have established themselves nationally as very, very, uh, and of course, human performance internationally. Um, so I, I see the, the, the quality of the academic programs having certainly um, grown, and I guess I've seen them really grown in the professional areas. I mean, in all, you know, I don't know enough about all of the, you know, the the other uh, humanities, but certainly with, I guess, CAP led the way as the first professional school. Well, I guess teachers call it service, right? But in terms of bringing on and really focusing on educating young men and women to enter a profession. And um, so I think that's been enormous. International travel, I mean, I don't know if Teachers College ever sent students abroad, maybe a little bit, but certainly you know that's another area we've really grown in. and. Um, this is true for every campus, but the overlay of the computer and technology is just enormous. Do you think the life of a faculty member is significantly different from the time you came here? Oh, absolutely. I think it's more complicated. Okay. All right, we'll talk about that. Yeah, I think it's more complicated. I think uh, it's a good I choice of words. Well, I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to be in some of my younger colleagues' shoes. Uh, I've sat on P&T committees, and I've had some of my colleagues you know, criticizing, and I'm, I'm sitting there trying to be, and I'm saying, boy, if I ever applied now, I wouldn't even make the short list, I don't think. So certainly the demands and I think the quality we're expecting, at least in architecture, of, of an incoming faculty member, uh, I guess since we didn't have, I mean, Dave Hermanson was our only senior faculty member besides Charlie, but um, I think there's certainly a much higher expectation for senior faculty, whether that's publishing or practicing or 
you know, composing or whatever. Uh, I have a feeling before with such a focus on teacher education that, not that it wasn't rigorous, but I have a feeling it just was much more, um, what should I say? I, I guess I just don't see the, the uh, competitiveness of it. Now, maybe it was, I mean, I guess you'd have to talk to some of the old uh, teacher's college folks to know. Well, well no, the, the answer to you is it wasn't. And I, I think those changes that began to occur, especially in the, in the early 80s, when mm -hmm. Jim Cook became provost, um, probably were an attempt on his part to align us more with peer institutions. Now, whether or not that was true for architecture schools and colleges that you're familiar with throughout the United States. Mm -hmm. and I, I guess what I'm saying is I'd like to think that if an assistant professor came here in architecture today and, uh, let's say, had a choice of going here or to uh, Michigan or Yale School of Design or something like that, that there would be equal rigor in regard to evaluating that person for progress and ultimately attaining tenure or becoming an associate professor. Um. I think we're getting there. Okay. One of the last things that I did on P and T was to just absolutely say, if we don't have external uh, evaluations for tenure, then you know, I mean, and, and that was a long time yeah. in coming, and there were colleagues who still fought it. That, that, that's a really good point because I think that's something that certainly during the 15 years I was provost, people really fought. Oh, uh, and, and yeah. you and you well know that if you are at a Michigan or you are at a Yale, that really have to prove as part of this process of attaining tenure and getting your first promotion that you have uh, a national reputation. Right. Is that, that fair? That's fair. Okay. That's fair. And I think, uh, and I, I think this is a positive and I think it's also a liability. Okay. I think we have placed from the very beginning such an emphasis on teaching. So we have, I have some colleagues who are phenomenal teachers. Uh, you know, I doubt if they've even published an article, or maybe if they did, you can count them on one hand in their entire career here. Uh, they've not practiced, I mean, I don't consider just doing a building to be the kind of practice that an right. academic, you need to be doing award-winning work or published work. And I have a feeling that that rigor of uh, the academy in terms of a um, uh, teacher-scholar, as you like yeah. to say, sure. I think is, um, is probably not up to the national standards. Now, I think to compare us certainly against the Mississippi States and the Auburns and so on and so forth, yes, but I would, I think we still got a way to go in saying we are, we are equally competitive to the academic rigor of um, some of the, you know, better known schools. We certainly, and this is something that is a cause of concern for me, uh, we are losing people that had any sort of a practice. So we really have a faculty now that if there's one tremendous weakness is we don't have very many faculty who have actually produced a lot of architecture. Okay. <laughs> they're, they're more, am I fair in saying, academic yeah, architects? rather than, and, and you know, we're trying to, obviously we bring up practitioners from Indianapolis to teach sure. studios. We've been fortunate to get Steve Risting, who was with Ratio, uh, but you know, I. There's just less and less full-time faculty who are running practices. And that certainly wasn't the case when you came here. No, because Charlie came out. I mean, the thing about it is, is Charlie was that unique blend who ran a very award-winning practice in Asheville and always taught at Clemson or NC State. And um, uh, so he, I mean, he believed very, in fact, he fought, uh, he fought some major P&T battles across campus here because I don't think people understood architectural practice as, as creative endeavor, professional yeah. practice, equal yeah. to yeah. the publishing of a book, which everybody can understand, equal to presenting a referee paper, yeah. which anybody can understand. Okay. But when you start talking about design awards or being invited to sit on a design jury, it's no different than being invited in many ways to, I guess, be a reviewer for a sure. book or yeah. so. Uh, you know, Charlie fought the good fight in that regard, and I think now, because of the reputation, I think people, I think our colleagues across campus probably have 
a, a little better sense of what we do, although, you know, still one of the common phrases is, well, they're just different. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if, you, if you think of somebody, and admittedly, I'm just picking on two schools so I know a little bit about them from a historical perspective. If you take a Michigan, you take a Yale, I mean, would faculty there today be people who were teacher scholars but have also produced architecture? Uh, to some degree, to some degree. I think a lesser degree there as well as here. And um, I'm not sure, because I have my own definition of good teaching. Oh, okay. I think we, we can hold our own, and our students will tell us this, when they've gone to an office and they talk about their education yeah, here right, and other right. people talk about theirs. Yeah. I think we have an amazingly dedicated faculty to teaching. Um, that is not often recognized. I mean, I know we say teaching, research, and service. We're here to teach. Yeah. But as you know, in many big universities, the idea of teaching a freshman class is like, you know, you're, you're like a bottom feeder. And um, yeah. so yeah. I think we've done a great job with that. Probably in some ways maybe a little bit to the detriment of what I would call rigorous academic research publishing presentations. This is, I've always wanted to ask somebody who really knows this from the inside of the CAP. I used to say to honor students as an outsider when I was in charge of the Honors College that the orientation of our faculty in the CAP is really more toward creativity than toward the engineering emphasis of a place like, say, Illinois or Cincinnati, where a lot of our top students will oftentimes be considering those. Right, sure. Is that really a fair thing for me to say? Um, <laughs> probably with Illinois, yes. Cincinnati, I think, has always been, um, has always uh, prided itself on a very good design school. Oh, okay. I mean, they have the, well, and the thing that has been, in fact, I just, who did I, oh, I was talking with David Dale, who's our neighbor. I think, of course, having come from Pratt with such a strong art school, yeah, right. uh, I always thought one of the things that, that hurt us was uh, that the art school was not somehow, and I'm not saying under us, but right. more integrated. Oh, I see, I see. And when we went from quarters yeah. to semesters, we dropped all of our art electives. Yeah. And I saw a definite change in our students that they were no longer exploring creativity yeah. with either, you know, sculpture or throwing pots or drawing. Yeah. Uh, because it was just, it's a different atmosphere when you're studying under a fine arts person. That's really funny because I, you know, I know some of the people over there, the, your dean in particular, happen to know the guy who's the current dean at Montana State. And they've got the fine arts college and the architecture college together. Mm -hmm. And I always thought that was kind of strange. But you think it's probably a good idea? I think it's, I think it's a good idea. <laughs> not, a, not to the exclusion. I mean, you've got to still have basic technical, you know, grounding yeah, and you know we're fortunate that both rod and bob went to engineering school then to art that's rare yeah. most and most people most faculty who are teaching structures come out of a pure engineering background so they don't have that other sense of you know a detail not only has to work but it has to look good is bob in this case fisher yeah no, i'm sorry yeah. Sure rod yeah. of course i know yeah and uh so i you know there's a constant battle if anything we have diminished Maybe the word substantially is a little little hard. The amount of rigor in our technical courses. Now, a lot of my colleagues would sit right here and tell you we still have too many. Right. Oh. Yet, you talk to any architect who employs young architects, and the first thing they say is, you know, they just don't understand how a building goes together. Oh. So we're talking about structures. We're talking about structures, materials, detailing. Oh. Um, how do you work with an electrical engineer on the lighting? How do you work with the HVAC engineer? Right. You know, all of those things are, uh, I mean, and, and part of it is the student mindset. It's not as exciting. Right, right, right. It's not as much fun <laughs> to go through a heat loss, heat gain calculation for a room than yeah, to design right. it. I yeah. mean, you know, and, and, and it's probably reinforced. I think a lot of us say, well, you know, a lot of that technical stuff you'll get when you get into practice. But my feeling is they've got to get an appreciation of it in college. They just can't blow it off. Because right. when they get into practice, they're going to say, oh my gosh, you know. <laughs> That's good. Other, other ways that Ball State remained the same from the day you got here to the day you retired? Um, I think, although maybe less just because of societal, 
I think it's remained amazingly a, a really friendly place. Right. Uh, I think um, I think for the most part, uh, it's a campus where I hope students feel very comfortable and friendly. And you know, I mean, in our college, it's first yeah. name basis. Right. Right. That's right. never changed. I know probably some other faculty would cringe at the idea that fact that students call me Tony and yeah. right. so on and so forth. Um, so I think that has remained. Um, maybe with the exception of, um, with few exceptions, I think well, probably the last of the old guard, the conservative guard, I think is gone, or, or just about ready right. to go. Right. And uh, so I think there's a vibrancy, there's kind of a, a sense of um, that baggage has been now kind of discarded. Because I'm assuming schools that go from state, I mean, I know the New York, you know, the SUNY system. Sure, same thing. I mean, obviously, they went from teachers' colleges in the middle of nowhere, I'm just going to uh, in the middle of nowhere, uh -huh. you know, New Paltz and, and, and Oneonta, I mean, you know, and, you know, they're pretty substantial, comprehensive universities now. Yeah. So uh, I guess it takes, I hate to say it takes, that generation that kind of felt they were the university or the state teachers college right. to kind of leave before there's still a little bit of this, you know, and maybe it's some of it's the respect to the heritage, like, well, you know, these guys built it or these women right. built that home ec department, now it's family and consumer science, yeah. but they were here in the trenches when, <laughs> so. I, I think you're right. Uh, another kind of little twist on that. I'm sure you can recall this. I mean, I'm looking at it more from an honors college perspective in terms of watching this happen. But I'd like you to comment a little bit on probably what was a, a fairly all-male campus group when you came here, and, and when this change, as you see, it began to occur, where you had this tre tremendous number of, uh, of women. Um, well, definitely. I mean, I remember when I came here, of course, we only had uh, uh, two classes. We had one woman, and she was a woman, she had been in the Army, uh, who was with the first class, dropped out in second year. And I think maybe the freshman class may have had three or four, so certainly, and we, and we mirror the profession of architecture. Obviously, there's been an enormous growth in uh, the percentage of women that are now in the profession. Uh, still dealing with the old guard, when that old guard goes, and there are a number of, you know, totally women-owned offices now doing award-winning work, so on and so forth. Um, certainly now, where we're having 40% female. Okay, that's not what it is. Yeah, it's, it's you know, typically in the low 40s. Um, I, I don't have any statistics to prove this, and, and I probably would be tarred and feathered in certain, certain circles for saying this, I think a little bit of the, what would you say, the reduction in rigor, uh, and maybe it's the best thing that ever happened. Maybe it's because as we got more and more female students, I think there may have been a little bit of a pullback from that, what I think almost was this physiological marathon of making it through the program. Yeah. Because I think a lot of the women students just wouldn't, how should I put this? They, they wouldn't put up with it. I mean, a certain amount of more, like we're gonna do anything the guys can right. do. But there were some others, and you know, they joined sororities, and they wanted to have a college life right. Right. <laughs> besides CAP. And yeah. as you know, um, that's a, you know, I, I have to applaud them, because many of them did that pretty well. Um, and we've graduated, women have graduated number one in our classes. I mean, Linda Nelson Keene, I mean, sure. so, uh, and Teresa Carpenter, and I mean, so, you know, not to say we haven't had incredibly strong women students come through, but maybe across the board. And um, on the other hand, I think it's the best thing that's ever happened to the school. I think there is more of a, uh, uh, what would you say, you know, you just get a bunch of guys together all the time. I mean, I think there is a little bit more <laughs> of a, a moderation. And I do think women have a slightly different viewpoint on many of the things in environmental design. Right. So, okay. um, I know this is a long list, so that's uh, all right. I try to contain this, but I, I want you to tell me um, some of the people who have been particularly influential on your long and distinguished career here, here on campus. Well, yeah. you know, I mean, yeah. I, 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 I've got people I've talked to, and they've said, well, you know, 
some of them have gone back to, I don't know, high no, school. No, no, <laughs> I, moved, I mentioned Pete Dottore in my art. Yes, you did. I, I, I actually have looked back and uh -huh. realized yeah. that I was privileged to have people like Sybil Maholanagi, Mario Salvadori, Romaldo Jergola. I mean, uh, you know, these were, these are people that looking back were the best of the best. And uh, they, I would put them in a category, kind of a pantheon of teachers that, that I was fortunate to look back on. I also had some great, I always tell people, and I've actually written this, that probably, and I really have lost track of him, but probably the one instructor that I, that I most try to emulate in my studio teaching was a young Egyptian architect named Yosef Bari, who uh, Philip Johnson was his sponsor, by the way. And Joe, Joe came over and taught at Pratt, and when we were on our Fulbrights, his father had been the equivalent under Nasser of the Attorney General. And they, was, they still lived in their villa and everything, I mean, and, uh, and uh, but Joe had that way, and, and it's he, second year critic, and he, he took you where you were going and he facilitated your design rather than this is what you need to be doing and this is what I think you should be yeah. doing. And I've always tried to do that. So certainly those, but needless to say, Charlie Sappenfield sure. was an enormous role model. And, and I just told him, not only in terms of teaching, but teacher practitioner. And uh, probably I, because we don't have many, probably I'm not sure if I would have gotten involved in the AIA anywhere near what I did and made a commitment and still are making a commitment to it if it wasn't for Charlie because Charlie was a tremendous advocate of, um, of number one of academics being really involved in the AIA to bridge the gap and certainly number two uh, you know the idea that that brings that professionalism into the academy so it's true it's two-way thing um, there's no doubt you know, colleagues like, like Marv Rosenman, uh, Rod Underwood, I, I would never, I, I say this, and I, uh, Rod and I took our RA to get our registration exam in the old Quonset huts. And uh, I would have never have passed structures. There were seven parts at that time. One was structures. If it wasn't for the fact that Rod had just passed his PE three months before and had this incredible notebook that I just Xeroxed. Because <laughs> you could bring in resource yeah, material. Sure, yeah. And if it wasn't for that, I, I got a 77. You needed 75s to pass. <laughs> I would have never have passed all that, and Rod and I are proud to say we got through that the first time, which only about 25% of the architects passed it the first time. Uh, and Rod's been a good friend. We've been through a lot together. Certainly, um, I think um, here, but outside the college, um, certainly there are some Indianapolis architects like David Meeker and Don Perry, who, you know, I was 26 years old and, and doing our first urban design studio during Luger's administration and, you know, still had that 60s kind of, and it was good in a way, but they, they were longer on the tooth, so they knew how to moderate that, which is going to go down to City Hall, and, you know, because here's the deputy mayor, and, and I, I learned a lot about you pick your battles and you don't, how should I put it, you don't, um, you don't lessen your values, but you also have to pick, especially with in those days. I mean, you know, the cities were very volatile. Uh, and then, and then certainly, you know, later on, I had the privilege to team teach with Evans Woolen, which a lot of people felt was were, he was arrogant. But Evans and I got along very well because he didn't intimidate me. You know, he went to Yale and I went to Columbia, so big deal. I'm not intimidated by Evans Woolens of the world. Um, and then there were just. Um, Certainly, as we began to really develop the community-based projects program and um, the urban design studio, certainly Hari Eggy, Michelle Munyar, and Scott Truex were the three that, um, you know, I hope I taught them something, but they certainly taught me a lot. So, and, and that's the great thing about yeah. teaching with young colleagues is, uh, you know, and now it's in their court, so to speak. But, uh, and of all those, probably Scott Truex interestingly enough, the youngest, yeah, right. uh, the most influential, <coughs> only because Scott, um, I think Scott has probably the best overview of um, the non-physical design aspects of urban design, the social, the economic, oh, yeah, the political, yeah, yeah. much stronger, and it's just a matter of his experience, sure. but, but much stronger, whereas I think certainly Hari and Michelle are more the designer 
the more traditional uh, urban designer as a designer. Well, Scott, I, Scott's really gotten in there and, oh, in a lot of really tough urban situations. And, he's been willing to try to get his, get his hands dirty. And his, and his yeah. uh, habitat experience yeah, and right, everything. Right, right. I mean, he's, a, he's truly, um, you know, he's more kind of an urban studies, urban yeah, yeah. dynamics right. person than right. he is a designer. Um, so those, I think, would be, okay. in terms of my teaching, Oh, one other person, okay, and I know right. you know, and this is interesting, but Father James Bates. Sure, sure. And, and, and interestingly enough, I'm not talking about in terms of building faith, but um, of course Jim was a lawyer before he became a priest, and he taught me about grant writing, because we, because in those days the Lilly Endowment was really into campus ministry, and we wrote a lot of grants to get St. Francis kind of going. and. After he wrote a grant, it was like, well, sure, you're going to fund this guy. I mean, he really taught me about you make your argument, and I think he had that lawyer mentality of, you know, you state things clearly, and boom. So, pretty unique guy. Yeah. Plus, he was a, my only three-time client <laughs> up until now. So, yeah, that's right. That's <laughs> that's you get him back after <laughs> once. That's right. <laughs> what, what are some of the areas that you were um, particularly involved with? And I'm going to follow up with, I guess, my macro question. It's going to be the community. So I'd like you to talk about, here's the university, here's my career here, here's some of the things that I got involved with, that, well, either for good or ill, I suppose. Well, there's no doubt that, uh, and this was what Charlie Sapp, I mentioned, this is what Charlie Sapp and Phil promised I would do, and he never relinquished. You know, I came out here to do urban design. Right. Um, I. I was given all the latitude. Uh, sometimes I stepped beyond the boundaries of good judgment and begged for forgiveness rather than a, and that was a Jim Bates thing with the bishop too, by the way. I learned that from him. Um, but you know, in those days, if you waited for all the approvals, you would never respond to a community where there was a window of opportunity that you either seized or it was going to be gone, whether that's political or economic window or whatever. Um, so certainly my, my greatest effort has been in, I guess, trying to bring a certain reality to our students while they're in school. And I always said, you got to get them off campus to do that. You know, I don't care modeling, I don't care gaming, I don't care what you do with simulations. There's simply no experience for getting them immersed in, and you know, as you know, we've done it in small towns, sure. or we've done it in the inner cities of Indianapolis. Um, so I think that is by far in a way. Um, I think I've had, you know, certainly I guess if you're here this long, I, I've been involved. I happen to be the chair of uh, uh, the curriculum committee when we went from quarters to semesters. And that was, uh, and l l let's just say that was another one of those challenging situations yeah. because every architecture, every architecture faculty member knows exactly the curriculum we should have. And obviously they're not the same. Um, do you think it was a good thing to make that change? Yes and no. Okay. I still think the 10-week design studios were just fine because it gave a student three opportunities to have design instructors okay. in a year. Okay. Although at Pratt, it was not uncommon for us to have three design instructors in one semester. One would do a five-week project, okay. one would do a seven, and one would do a three. Okay. Then they got together yeah. at the end. And, and, and there was a much more rich, when you graduated, you basically almost had had the whole faculty at some point. And that's, you know, and, and we, we have students who, at the, kind of by the luck of the draw, are going to miss some people. If you think of 10 studios and 28 faculty. Um, and, and then I would like to think that, uh, but maybe this is your next question, you know, I'd like to think that one of the things I did was to, I hope, show <laughs> the, the other Muncie that faculty members here um, have a sense of what community is about, that we're not simply these pie in the sky Ivy Tower people. So we'll talk a little bit more about that because I think of all the people I've interviewed, you probably have been more involved and identified with urban design studio, community projects. Mm -hmm. and so I mean, you come from New York. Right. <coughs> you come into <coughs> excuse me, the nation's middle town and you've been involved with it as a kind of changing fabric, urban fabric if you will, in addition to your work in a smaller community right. in Indiana. Indianapolis is the capital of the state. I mean, I, I know that's a huge topic, but just I'd like you to give me kind of a New Yorker comes here okay. perspective during your career as to what this really meant, how you did that. I think there were just probably th three main influences. One, of course, were my parents. Uh, you know, we 
and, and, and what was fortunate, I look back now, is although I grew up in Corona, in right. fifth grade we moved up to, yeah, right. well, just north of Peak School, New right. York. Yeah. And so uh, I graduated with a high school, brand new high school. It was one of those consolidations of three little rural districts yeah. that used right. to go to Peak School High. And then they formed, so I graduated with a high school class of about 106. I mean, that was relatively small. Sure. Um, and I, my dad helped to start the volunteer fire department. And uh, interestingly enough, they were founding members of a new parish there, which, so I guess, and, and in our family, service was just one of the things you did. There was no question about it. I think it was based on our Catholic faith. It was, it was based on, um, I guess, in a way, because even small towns or, or hamlets are like a neighborhood. They just don't have that ethnic concentration. But people care as much about their neighbor and so on and so forth. Um, so that was one. Going to Pratt and I think being literally immersed in the middle of one of the most disinvested, deprived areas in the, city, in, you know, the country, yeah, right. um, I think really began to open my eyes to, um, here we were on campus doing, you know, ski lodges up in the Adirondacks and we were doing beach resorts out on the island. And I'm looking across the, the <coughs> soccer field, because Pratt had a very good soccer team, NAIA, at, you know, the brownstones with people, you know, hanging out the yeah, windows right. on a hot day, and you're going, there's a little bit of a disconnect here between what they're teaching us. Fortunately, in fifth year, I will have to give Pratt credit, everybody took an urban design student. Oh. Now, we studied Red Hook. Oh, and man, I'll tell you, if I, you know, you want to, you want to immerse in a tough, you know, with the Red Hook housing projects and everything. Other, other people studied Astoria, and uh, so when I went to Columbia, I, I really, I really felt like I was gravitating away from single building architecture, you know, toward that. And then, very honestly, when we got here, and our first urban design studio was in Indianapolis, and as you know, uh, 26 years ago, there was a lot to do. And I'd like to think that our college has played a role in, 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 in helping that city. Um, and then when we started the small town program, I was really comfortable going into small towns. And people would even comment, for a New Yorker, you seem to understand that the guy in the bib overalls in the corner, he might look like a hayseed farmer, but the guy's worth three and a half million dollars, and if he gives a thumbs down, I don't care what you're proposing, it's not going through. Um, and of course, Muncie, I've always felt, and, and this is where some of my colleagues and I have gotten into some pretty interesting discussions. Uh, I always said, if you don't, if you don't get involved in your in your own hometown, you know, where are you going to get involved? And 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 because I said to people, it benefits my children, it benefits our family, it benefits my colleagues' family. Um, you know, whether that's Westview Elementary School or whether that's starting Muds or whether that's and, and again, here, I, it became really obvious that south of the tracks was a whole different Muncie. Yeah, right. And uh, <laughs> once we moved out of the downtown, and I kind of had, after the Pan Am Games, when we resurrected MUDS, it was up to me what we were going to do. And, and I just said, we're going to deal with affordable housing. And of course, Alice McIntosh had become a good friend by then. And I think in many ways, she was influential. Um, uh, a lot of people had a tough time with Alice, but I liked Alice because she, uh, she was an advocate for her people. There was no doubt about it. There's a question we, you can get on the record and then somebody will come back and look at this 20 years from now and see if you're right. But since you've been so involved in this, what do you think the future of the South Side of Muncie is? I'm, uh, I am thrilled. Okay. I am absolutely thrilled. I, I think, you know, the, the article in the paper about Walmart being the magnet, I, okay. I think it is going to attract additional um, economic um, investment. Uh, needless to say, probably the project I am most personally proud of is the Wilson School, yeah. the historic Wilson School. And I don't like to use the pronoun I, but I yeah. I was the one that went before the school board yeah. when they were going to issue the, uh, the uh, you know, the uh, contract for demolition and said, just give me 30 days. Yeah. And it's interesting, you know, I tell students, you know, they would have never have given me any, anything if I hadn't established relationships, you know, with Marilyn Carey sure. and uh, with Carl Kaiser, yeah. you know, and uh, Leon Dixon was strictly, we were going to save $680,000 in demolition. Yeah. That's okay. <laughs> that, that's what he, that's why he, I told people, each one voted 
for a different thing. Yeah, that's right. Marilyn voted for historic preservation, yeah. Carl because it was going to be on the south side, yeah. and Leon because of economics. And, and I tell the students, you've got to figure out yeah. where your advocates are coming from. Leon could give a damn if it was historic, you know. So um, I think the south side, it's going to take a long, long time. I think we need to get some people in there to replace the Mary Jo Bartons, right. uh, because I think so much of it is so grounded in the old politics. Yeah. Uh, but you've got some new, um, you know, you've got some people that have invested in Madison Street, yeah. and uh, yeah. right. and obviously I think we we are going to see uh, the Walmart generate um, some additional. So I'm laughing about that because somebody said to to me the other day, "Well, you never go to the South Side of town. Because you don't have to go there now even to get your uh, your license plate." I said, "Yeah, but they got a Mongolian barbecue over there." There you go. I hit on a Mongolian barbecue place yeah. in Montana of all places. And so, if you want the, the true Mongolian barbecue experience, you go to the South Side. And then, of course, I think you know, and we and and it's interesting because Bruce Race had come in for the 40th, yeah. and he was involved in boat charrettes. But I think anybody who goes past the old Munciana homes and oh, sees yeah. Millennium Place, that's a hell of a change on any scale. <laughs> Joy said those homes look like the townhouses they're putting up in Montana. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I think, you know, as you well know, change is incremental. But I think if you add up all the increments, uh, it's, it's um, I mean, it's the best library now. I mean, you oh, know, yeah, the, the sure. Maring Hunt is a beautiful building. Wool and Mozan did a great, great job. Uh, the 50, you know, affordable housing for seniors. Uh, and then you got the K. I, I, I started to use the word campus, multi-generational right, yeah. campus, because you've got Southview, library, and residence. Yeah. You know, it's really, that's what we all talk about, this cross-generational and there's a grand, you know, they have surrogate grandparents reading things at the at the oh, school. Oh, I know. It's, it's, it's a terrific, a terrific it's, thing. It's great. And it, that could have all been landfill. That's the thing that's... <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so. Well, let me bring it back to campus. Okay. One of my other big questions here that I ask all the people who participate in the study is to give me your perspective on the role of the faculty in the university. And, and what I was trying to get at here is to hear was to have people reflect a little bit about the role of the faculty in the decision-making process, whether it's the department, the college, right. the university, the whole deal. Um, well, number one, you know, and this is very personal with me, but the number one um, reason that I think a faculty member um, is, a, is at a university is to teach. Now, you know, this okay. is to me that that's what always held me here, rather than looking at a research institution right. and all of that. There, um, I think at the department level, it's absolutely critical that the curriculum and governance is driven by the faculty. Right. And we've had department chairs over the years that I think have done a really, really good job um, managing a faculty that, as you know, is very diverse and yeah. comes from come from different backgrounds and have different notions of what an architect does yeah. or what architecture is. Um, I think certainly at the college level, um, probably to a slightly lesser degree, only because you can only be so much involved with micromanaging up there as a faculty member, but I think we've had, certainly Charlie was very, very, um, well, Charlie was very inclusive and when, when we started off. And uh, I think the thing that unfortunately finally uh, was his demise is I don't think he could let go of the other departments. Oh. I think he, he somehow felt that he needed to still be the, the, the driving force behind LA and planning, and he wasn't either. And um, I think that's what ultimately I think he just needed to let those go, and he didn't. And, but, but I think we've had deans with few exceptions that again have been smart enough to realize that the faculty is not going to be doing a very good job if they don't buy into, um, I think the one thing that has been unfortunate, and, and I, I revert back to my good friend Andy Seeger, and I can see him when we went from programs uh, to departments, I remember Andy saying, I'll vote for it if we are departmentalized but not compartmentalized. And I think we are very compartmentalized. It's national. It's the it's the issue of the professions. LA and ARC and planning nationally have a very difficult time. As much as we talk about interdisciplinary work, right. very few faculty are willing to do it. 
and yet we, you know, now we do have that common first year, which is held up as a wonderful thing, but after that, forget it, you know, and many of us think that the fourth year there should be a mandatory interdisciplinary quarter or semester in the fourth year that does bring people back, but that's neither here nor there. Um, very honestly, I applaud my colleagues who were involved. I did serve in the Senate for, I guess, two terms. Um, it was never of interest to me, but I know that um, I think faculty need to feel, you know, that they have a role in governance. And I think, I think they become, I guess in many ways, it's uh, like the executive branch and the legislative branch. I mean, I think the faculty, I guess if they feel totally disinvested, if they feel that their concerns are not being heard, um, then I think they, it starts to become adversarial. And that drains a lot of energy, as you know, from all participants. And you wind up with very little improvement. I think you wind up with people staking out almost compromises. And, you know, so I, you know, I think it takes, um, and, and as I said, I'm glad, we, I'm glad I had colleagues that were willing to do that. I, I never was willing to invest in that. Did, did you ever regard yourself as maybe a little bit atypical uh, because, you know, you were a distinguished professor, you were a senior faculty, you knew people uh, at the university administration level pretty well, that if you wanted to have a Tony Costello opinion or the Tony Costello voice to be heard, that you had ways to do it? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. I mean, uh, the, the, best, the best example is with, uh, is with the old alumni house and the McKinley house. And, and that's, you know, I just, uh, so yes. And, and, and I don't think, I hope I didn't abuse that, no. but uh, there were times when either um, my opinion would be solicited or I would find a way to make sure that my opinion got to whoever I thought should have it. Well, you talk about Wilson School, and I'll grant you that from your perspective, but I think the whole alumni house thing is really something to get on the record because when People like you originally said, you know, you shouldn't tear it down. It's really got a lot of importance, and then we came up with the idea of moving it. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget when Kinghorn came in to John Worthen and senior staff and showed, showed him a piece of paper and said, this is what it will cost to move it. And we thought, well, it's a lot of money, but when we think of all the grief we're going to take <laughs> if we don't do it, and we had to knock down a couple of neat trees, so the green guys got all upset about right, it. Right, right. But when I drive by the siding of that house right. now, Joy looks at me and says, you know, it's like it's always been there. Yep. Those trees, they, it, it is. It is. It absolutely is. Yeah. To, me, it, to me, it works with Lucina. Yeah. It works with Elliot, it, sure. Burris. And, um, you know, yeah, you know, I would have rather have seen it on that site. Sure. I still think a creative architect could have yeah. done a residence for visiting oh, yeah, music faculty. That could have been spectacular. Yeah. But, you know, it was a compromise. And I yeah. think that it, it kind of... Um, well, certainly, you know, I try to be fair. I applaud Tom for, you know, Ball Jim, what sure. they invested in that. I think it's a phenomenal right. example, yeah. what they've invested in the arts building with, I mean, you know, certainly Ball State is exemplary of taking yeah. older buildings and oh, yeah. really investing. And as you know, it's not inexpensive to do it. Well, I'm laughing about that because when I got back, and uh, I guess it was a year ago, and saw what they were going to do to the facade of the parking garage across from what is now the Burkhart building. Yeah. And I can recall Kingor coming into another meeting and saying, we're not going to make this look like a parking garage. It's going to look like an academic building. And now, when I go by it, it does look like an if academic building. If you put glass building. in those openings, you'd have one of the nicer facades on campus. Yeah, I have to agree. So I, you know, I often have been critical of some of the things that are part of what I call Tom Kinghorn's vision of this campus. Yeah. But some of this stuff, I have to confess, has really worked well. And McKinley Avenue yeah. is just phenomenal. Yeah, no, I will give him his due when it's deserved, yeah. you know. Okay. <laughs> okay, last question, but really appropriate to your career. Over the time you've been here, how do you see the relationship between the town and the gal? Improved. Do you? Okay. I see it improved. I see, I think, a better understanding. Um, and I still remember when Alan Wilson ran and said, you know, we're going to make better use of the resource. And that's what MUDS, I mean, Patrick Murray, $4,000 grant oh, is what started yeah, MUDS. Right. Um, <laughs> I think there is a better understanding. I think that, you know, certainly John Worthen and, and you know, John Pruis, I think we've had administrators, you, that, that have bridged that gap. Now, the South Side's a whole nother thing, you know, 
but you know, I hope that MUDS has been somewhat instrumental in at least being able to do. I think there's there's always going to be that you know the head in the sand, which you know is going to say that's that's a whole different culture out there at the university. Um, but I think as uh, the next generation comes to Ball State, I mean, I'm, it would be interesting to see how many kids from the South Side come to Ball State, and 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 that can only help to somehow you know, begin to say, yeah, that boy, are we lucky to have that university here. And I think the other thing, and they may not want to admit this, and it's, in a way it's, it's a shame, but think of this place now without Ball State University being what it is and Ball Hospital being what it is. No town. I mean, they're yeah, the true. two largest and most yeah. stable employers. Obviously, we, have a, we are two of the economic engines, yeah, yeah. And, 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 and those engines have increased in their speed uh, whereas a lot of the other ones have gone off, either come to a stop or gone off on a siding somewhere. So I, I would hope people getting down just to the nitty gritty of, you know, I think most people would agree education and health services are two of the most important things the community can have. And I hope that's bridged a little bit of it. Um, people like Dave Ferguson being so involved with Cardinal Greenway, again, any time there's, there's a university, you know, Tom Spangler, kind of the unsung hero yeah. of the whole beautification program. Sure, sure. Any time that there's people, and it comes down to individuals, although I will say that certainly, you know, SVS, I mean, you know, when you go over to a mean, mom's... Ron Spangler. Ron Spangler, I'm sorry, Ron, over in L.A. Tom, Tom just makes everybody Yeah, I'm sorry. Right. Uh, you know, when you go over to mom's and you see all the teacher, you know, the kids that are tutoring there on their own, um, when you see, really, uh, it, it's, it's, I think, I think it's come along, it has a long way to go, and uh, I think both sides can, can do better if, if anything, and I'm biased, if anything, I think the university has extended a longer hand. I think the community is, uh, has certainly responded, but there is still a, um, how should I put this, there's still in many ways Disrespect may not be. I, I just think there's a there's a misunderstanding, and you know when you deal with people like uh, Basil Davis, I mean, yeah, right. no, you're never going to convince him right. that the university offers something yeah, here. Right. You know, so. So like the environmentalists and the agricultural community. Exactly. No matter what you do, you'll never bridge no, the gap. No, no, there's going to be a battle of of, yeah. of the uh, wits there. So. Yeah. At the end of these interviews, I uh, always ask of the people I'm interviewing to step back a little bit and reflect on anything else they might wish to add. Uh, so this is your opportunity, Tony, to add anything well, you want. Well, <laughs> I've said this to people publicly. I, if, if I had to do it all over again, I would do it all over again. I, I, you know, as you well know, for me going across the Hudson River was going <laughs> west. So I think the opportunity that I was given here, uh, I think very few young professors would ever have been given the opportunity that Charlie gave me. And I think it's just been amazing that I think our college's growth coinciding with Indianapolis's growth. Uh, I've been able to stand back and, you know, maybe it's because Friday was our alumni yeah, reunion right, and right. you see people like Craig Mullins and you see people yeah. like Roger Norton Schwander and, yeah. and you're saying, um, you know, I think I have in a very small way made a difference. And oh, that, difference, that difference is not yeah. just in Indiana, but it is national and yeah. even international with Roger and Craig Hartman and it's been good. I, I, as I said, I have, and as, and I, I will end on this. Ball State has treated me very, very well. Yeah. I would have to agree, both from your perspective and mine. I'm talking about the two of us. Yeah. Thank you very much for the interview. You're welcome. My pleasure.